This case dates back to the infancy of the internet and the beginning of online chatroom connections. And we were about to find out the hard way what could go wrong. Make yourself a drink, sit in a cozy spot, put the volume up, and get ready to feel creepy vibes. Each meal was carefully planned, savory, tasty, and neatly served for her family. You see, family meals were very important for Francisca, and one ingredient was always present in those meals. If you thought it was love, well, not sweet, but no, it wasn't love, it was cyanide. Over the course of her life, Francisca came to be known in several ways. Paggy, as her family would call her. Then there was Fogosa, the passionate lover from Melilla, which was her online persona. Or what authorities and the media would ultimately dub her given the horrendous crime she committed. Her crime and motive were indeed perverse. She slowly planned and executed the poisoning of her entire family because she desperately wanted a fresh start with an internet lover. And she met this internet lover through an online chat room. This is the story of venomous Francisca Ballesteros. It was a warm August Sunday in 2003. Paki fanned herself as she started to feel heated and she began undoing a couple of buttons on her summer dress. Her tightly packed flesh was sweating. Her breath was quickening. And it was not because of the August heat in Melilla that summer, but because of the passionate words that username Tenerife Aventurero was writing to her in an online chat room. She had now become very addicted to joining. Now I am the one who reacts just like you wanted after the things you have said to me. Packy writes in the chat, you have managed to get me undressed. Although Tenerife Adventure was not the only man she corresponded with, he was the online lover she was getting much more addicted to. Her online nickname was Fogosa. In that online community, it meant horny. Tenerife Aventurero writes back, mm, I don't just want to imagine it, baby. Fogosa answers, this is so hot. I'd love for you to see me. You know, I'm all yours. Mom, where is my new shirt? The voice of her 15-year-old daughter, Sandra, startled Paki and brought her back to her dreaded boring reality. Paki quickly exited the chat and left the web. She did not want her exciting double life discovered. The computer now safely turned off and in the kitchen she went to make dinner, leaving her the Nerife adventurer desiring her passionately. Francisca Ballesteros, Paki, was a 34-year-old housewife who made her life about taking care of her family. She was a mother to three children, but in 1990 tragedy would strike and her youngest, Florinda, would die suddenly just as she turned six months old. Her death was ruled a crib death without much more examination, leaving Packy with only two children. Poor Packy, carrying all of that grief so strongly after the sudden death of her parents also, were the sorrowful comments that echoed throughout the neighborhood. Everyone felt sympathy for Packy's pain, for she had lost her parents, both to cardiac arrest and respiratory failure under her dutiful care. For her devotion, she had kept a modest, small inheritance. But for Antonio Gonzalez, her husband and the father of her children, losing their baby Florinda was a hard blow from which he never quite seemed to recover. And lately it had gotten even worse. His physical condition was quickly deteriorating and it seemed to be worsening by the day. He relied more than ever on his beloved Baki. Among many household chores that plagued her every day, Paki always found time to sit at the computer. She was an intelligent, quick learner who easily made her way into the world of the internet. She searched through the many internet sites for medicines, cures, and remedies to her husband's worsening condition. She had settled on Colme, which is a very aggressive medication that contains cyanide as one of its ingredients, and it was marketed as a remedy to fight alcoholism. She carefully looked over the side effects, hallucinations, heart attacks, coronary and respiratory failure. A gleeful, sneaky smile began to form on her face as she placed the order once again. Yes, this was not her first time. This was another bottle of the many she had already bought and used. She switched quickly from that page to her favorite chat room and right back to her candid conversation with online lover, Tenerife Aventurero. Hello, Aventurero. Your fiery baby needs your pampering, Baki wrote. Her husband needed constant caring these days. And during her frustrating moments, dealing with her husband's ailment, 
she frequently escaped into the fascinating world of online chat rooms, a place where she could be whoever she wanted and talk to anyone she wanted. The freedom was exciting and a feeling that she had not felt in a very long time. She needed this. She needed this escape from the reality that was drowning her. But Packy was not always looking for an escape. In 1987, a young 18-year-old Packy married Antonio, a promising young man who had a respectable job as a customs official. Tall, handsome, and strong. His best attribute was that he was head over heels in love with Packy. After all, she was his first and only girlfriend. People commented that no one had ever seen Antonio around any other woman. From the start, he had only eyes for Packy. Now, fast forward to 17 years of marriage and three children later, and the life she had chosen seemed to weigh on Packy. That is, now that she had discovered through the internet the world that awaited her outside her family, outside a relationship that had turned abusive. According to the allegations her defense team would make in court, she did not dream of that white picket fence. She wanted endless passionate nights, the sexy man making love to her and no children that constantly needed her attention. She felt she deserved more and she was going to take it for herself by getting rid of everything or everyone that stood in her way. Fogosa writes, The days go by without excitement and I've always felt you need to look forward to something, don't you think? Life without something that makes you dream and get excited is just not worth living. Then Edifia Adventure responds, I still can't believe that a woman like you is not married. The men around you must be idiots. I'm going to take care of you like the queen you are. All I want in life is to have you. I can't wait to meet you, to see you, to touch you, to make love to you. I need to meet you in person. Fogosa writes back. Soon. Everything will change very soon. And that day, Packy began administering a double dose of colme. But Packy wasn't administering cyanide to Antonio's food alone. No. If she wanted a fresh start, she needed to get rid of her children too. Daily, she would give her entire family a very nice little cocktail of cyanide and painkillers in their meals. It was now October, and Antonio was worse than ever. He spent his 42nd birthday in the intensive care unit of Hospital Comarcal. His doting wife, Packy, never left his side. Antonio briefly would show signs of slight recovery, and Packy would request his immediate discharge from the hospital and back home. Once home, Antonio's next meal would be a very savory cyanide painkiller dose that would, once again, plummet him to the depths of hellish pain. While Antonio lay there dying, Packy would calmly sit at her favorite spot in the house and back to her lover's virtual arms. Fogosa writes, Do you dream of something? Then Edipi Adventure replies, I'm dreaming of having you, Fogosa. What about you? Fogosa answers, I'm very clear in what I want. I dream of a man who would truly love me and spend my life with him. Then Erife Menturero writes back, Could that man be me? Fogosa replies, You have to earn it. You won't regret it. When I fall in love, I give all body and soul. Peggy was weaving a tangled web of lies. And by November of 2003, Antonio was back in the emergency room. But this time, he wasn't the only patient. Their two children were also admitted with signs of intoxication. Packy had to find a way to explain the situation, and explain the way she did, by saying that a week earlier she had done some pest control and fumigated her kitchen, which could explain some of the cross-contamination with food causing the intoxication of her children. But no one really asked any further questions, or even became suspicious of the fact that everyone was intoxicated, except for Packy. Conveniently, except for Packy. Fogosa writes, I can't wait any longer without meeting you. Tenerife Adventure replies, Your Tenerife Adventure is looking forward to you. You know how much I want you. And it was that same eagerness that Packy would buy a ticket to travel to Tenerife Canary Islands. It was now December 2003. And Cesareo, that's the real name of her online lover, a resident of San Cristobal de la Laguna, was eagerly awaiting for her to go from virtual lover to a lover of flesh and blood. It was in the bed of a hotel near the beach where all kinds of promises were made between them, including a surprising marriage proposal from Cesareo. Even more surprising was the fact that Paki accepted the proposal, even though she was already married. 
and had a family back in Melilla. But that was not going to stand in the way of Paki's new life with Cesareo. With remarkable acting skills, Paki told Cesareo through tears nonetheless that she was a widow and that her husband and daughter had died in a tragic traffic accident, which very much moved her lover. I'm so sorry, my dear. You have suffered so much, commented Cesareo as he held her in his arms. When it was time to leave her lover, Paki told Cesareo that she had matters to resolve in Melilla before their wedding, such as selling her house, and indeed she had a lot to finish back home. Like, for example, you know, continuing to poison her husband and her children. By now, Christmas was approaching, and Pacquiao was jollier than ever. A jolly mood that nobody understood and didn't really much make sense, given the dark scenario she had going on at home. Everyone seemed to have fallen ill, and Antonio was looking like he was hanging on to life by a thread. But to the neighbors, she acted like a mother and a wife who was suffering. Poor Paki. Unlucky Paki, destined to suffer such a strangely cruel destiny. One afternoon, in the middle of a conversation with Cesareo, her son Antonio Jr. entered the room. Mom, I've been calling you for a while. And Cesareo, I mean, he was taken aback. He heard this and he was so confused and shocked to hear someone call Paki mom. After all, she was the widow who had lost her only daughter in the same car accident as her husband. But there was no mention of any boys. Cesario questioned her about it, and Paki motioned for her son to get out of the room. Paki quickly explained, Yes, um, well, it's just that some friends usually leave me their son to take care of, and he loves me so much that he actually calls me mom. What a charming little boy, don't you think? But Cesario, you know, he was smart. He was not too convinced by her explanation, and uh, he was growing more and more suspicious of why Paki was not willing to set a date for their wedding yet. On the other hand, Paki was left thinking about how much her children and her husband annoyed her and were interrupting her plans with her lover. On January 12, 2004, Antonio Gonzalez died in the same hospital where he had turned 42 just three months earlier. The official cause on the coroner's report, a heart attack. After Antonio's death, the children began to miss a lot of school. The day after their father's death, they went to buy ham at a butcher shop. The shopkeeper noticed that they were in poor health. The boy was pale. He suffered from a strange tremor in his legs that made it hard for him to walk. He was holding on to his sister for strength. At times, his legs seemed to almost give away. The clerk, worried, asked Packy why she hadn't taken them to the doctor. Oh no, that's nothing. It's bad right now because of their father's recent death. You know, he's weak because his appetite is just not great, but he'll be just fine, replied Packy, very relaxed. Like she was explaining a paper cutaway or something like that. And she went on to purchase her pound of ham nonchalantly. What was really going on in the Ballesteros home was beyond horrifying. Sandra was having nocturnal hallucinations in which she would beckon for her father to help her with the pain. I want to go with you. Please take me. Help me. It hurts so much. She would cry out feverishly. Her cries were so loud that the neighbors next door would hear her scream. Paki was administering more colme and more sedatives to weaken both children and prevent them from calling for help. Neither Sandra nor her brother Antonio were eating anything at this point. They vomited almost everything and whatever stayed in their bellies contained cyanide and sedatives. Time was going by, and Sandra's school friends were growing very concerned for her. And for her mounting absences, and on her several occasions, they attempted to visit her, but Paki would always tell them that it was best for them to let her rest and process what was going on, and she would prevent them from seeing her. Paki had everything under calculated control. These days, she was splitting her time between taking care of her children and her calls to her beloved Cesareo. But Cesareo, on the other hand, was losing all patience as the months were rolling by without Paki coming back to marry him. One day, a surprise visit by the children's grandmother would change things for Paki. The chilling plan that Paquita had concocted did not include the possibility that her husband's family would interject in her plans. 
Packy tried to prevent her from entering the home, but the grandmother insisted until she sneaked into her granddaughter's bedroom. Shock and horror filled the room as she would see the true state in which her oldest granddaughter was. Lying on her back in bed in agony, on dirty sheets that smell of sweat, urine, feces, and dead skin, full of pus-filled sores all over her body and postules on her face. She looked like she had not moved from that bed in weeks, displaying lack of care, extremely malnourished, ash-toned skin that looked paper-thin. Sandra could hardly breathe, and she saw her grandmother. And when she did, she tried to say something to her, but the words would not come out. Packy once again quickly tried to explain away what was happening by acting irritated. Irritated that the hospital had denied admitting her daughter due to lack of available beds. Yeah, that's the excuse she gave. Lack of available beds. As June 4th, 2004 rolled around, the grandmother, having not believed Packy, reached out and told another relative, Ricardo, the children's uncle. And he showed up at Packy's home and horrified by what he saw as well he himself called an ambulance sadly by then it was too late after only a few hours the young woman died with obvious signs of intoxication sandra of only 15 years of age passed away in a hospital bed suffering a prolonged and excruciatingly painful death the hospital was also currently admitting her brother antonio jr as he too showed signs of suffering the same ailment as his sister. In Sandra's body, they found remains of Colme. It was a striking find and a lucky find. You see, Colme tends to be eliminated from the body between 6 to 12 hours after having ingested it. They found Colme in a bottle of water that the young woman had on her nightstand. She died of cirrhosis, a disease that did not match her age. These strange findings, as well as the state of Sandra's body, alerted the doctors, who reported Packy to the authorities for further investigation. Her web of lies was closing in on this black widow. Tired of Packy not answering his calls or responding to his messages in the chat, and that the few times that she did, it was to put him off without convincing reasons, Cesareo finally broke off his engagement and relationship with Packy. But that did not stop Packy from continuing her murderous plans. Now, she only had her 12-year-old son left to kill. Life had other plans for Packy. And hope for Antonio, and on June 7, 2004, just three days after Sandra's death, she was finally arrested by the police, saving Antonio's life just in time. He would spend months in the hospital recovering from the damage that monster caused him. It would not be easy for him to face the cruel loneliness and devastation provoked by his very own mother who had left him without a father, without siblings, and consequently now also without a mother. During the trial, Packy stated, I did what I did because they suffered too much. This was out of compassion, and they wanted to go with their father. I merely helped them to do it. Francisca Ballesteros murdered her six-month-old daughter, Florinda, in 1990. Her husband, Antonio, age 42, in January of 2004. Her daughter, Sandra, age 15, in June of 2004, and attempted to murder her son, Antonio Jr., age 12. In September of 2005, venomous Francisca Ballesteros was sentenced by the Provincial Court of Malaga to 84 years in prison. The penalties had the aggravating factors of treachery, cruelty, and kinship. During trial, evidence came out that Packy did not suffer from any personality disorder, nor was she psychotic. She had full use of her mental faculties during the 14 years in which she was exterminating her family. It was suspected that she was involved in the strange and sudden death of both of her parents. If you enjoy listening to true crime, paranormal, mystical, conspiracies, and all things creepy, please subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on TikTok at creepyvibes underscore podcast, on Instagram at Creepy Vibes Podcast and on YouTube at Creepy Vibes Podcast. If you have a true crime case you would like me to cover, a paranormal event that occurred to you, or simply have a creepy story you would like to share, 
please contact us via email at creepyvibespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review, comment, and share so that our community may grow. 